And welcome into In Depth with Fox Carolina Sports. Hey there, I'm Aaron Cheslock, and we are joined by Dallas J, the star goalkeeper of the Greenville Triumph, as the 2021 season is about to start back up. And I'm sorry, I should have identified you in a different way. Uh, USL League One champion Dallas J, uh, coming off a championship season and. Uh, I can only imagine you guys are chopping at the bit to get this thing going in 2021. Uh, how excited are you guys to get a season uh, underway that hopefully looks a little bit more normal than last year's did? Uh, I mean, we, we couldn't be more excited at this point. It was a uh, obviously a very successful uh, 2020 season um, being uh, being league champions. Um, but it's a new year. It's, it's a new task at hand. And, and uh, you know, for a lot of guys, the returning guys and obviously some of the new players added into the group, um, it was a long off season. I mean, we, I think I left Greenville uh, early November for the off season, didn't come back until, um, you know, early to mid February. So a few months of just sitting, waiting, you know, wanting to get back and, and get back with the team and get back to work. So um, we're a few weeks in the preseason now. We're, we're looking pretty sharp. We're incorporating a lot of the, the new players um, back with, you know, the, the good core group of guys that we brought back from the championship team last year. And we're, we're ready to make another run at it. Um, Coach Harks is very adamant that we're not, uh, we're not, defending the title we're just we're going out and looking to win another one so we've, we've taken that mindset that approach through preseason we're looking forward to getting started april 24th so we'll talk about you know the upcoming season a little bit here and uh but i'd be remiss not to touch on the end of last season you know 2020 you guys are going into the championship match and you played a lot of soccer in your day I'm not sure you've ever gone into a situation like you did at the end of last year. And it is, you know, for the wrong reasons, apropos for 2020 in pro sports, uh, the match gets canceled as your opponents dealing with COVID issues. What was the mood at that point with the team? And then looking back on it now, six months later, uh, how do you kind of put it into perspective? Yeah, you know, going into that final match, I think we were we were preparing for what was going to be a Friday night final um, here at home in front of our fans. We were still, you know, we were uh, limited attendance, but still were able to have fans in the stands and, and the guys were excited. We were um, for the group that of guys that were, were here in 2019, um, got to experience a final that year, um, unfortunately lost. So we had we had a you know, bad taste in our mouth from the 2019 season. And that final that we were looking to uh, rectify in 2020 and and uh, earn something we thought we missed out on the year before. So going into that final, a lot of excitement, a lot of, uh, you know, we worked hard to be able to have the right to host it. Um, and it was on the Thursday uh, before training, Coach Harks and the staff addressed us, told us um, there had been some COVID issues um, with uh, Union Omaha's team. Um, and, you know, at that point, first and foremost, it was, you know, obviously the, the health of the players and everyone around that. But secondly, it became, OK, what's going to happen with the final? Are we going to postpone it? Are we, you know, do they have enough players to send down and play the game? A lot of confusion. Um, and, you know, the league, the, the, the two clubs all came together and, and decided um, something that I think had been previously put into the rules that if, if a final could not be played, it would be, you know, the championship would be awarded to the team that was, you uh, the most points per game uh, through the season, but, you know, we feel we earned it. We were top of the top of the league the entire season, um, but it was, it was bittersweet not getting to have that kind of final moment to really go out and, and, and earn it. Um, I, I look back, I still wish we could have played that game. I don't know what would have happened, uh, um, but that's, that's the moment as a player that you work for is to get to play in finals. So missing out on that was tough, but um we, we don't uh, we don't scoff at the fact that we didn't earn earn that trophy. And, um, you know, going into this year, it's hopefully COVID is a, a little less uh, of an issue around our games around the season. But, you know, the USL championship last year, the, the, the league above us were USL League One. Um, they're the tier above us. Same thing. Final got canceled um, due to COVID issues. So it was very much a, a 2020 uh, finish to the year. No, but, you know, I'll back you on that point where, you know, I remember going on TV when it happened and going through the list of accomplishments that you guys had. There, there's nothing you could have done to, you know, uh, enhance your position any more than going out and winning the final, which was taken away from you. Uh, so, uh, you know, obviously it's not the way the 
the way you wanted the result to happen. But I, you know, I think uh, nothing to hang your hat, head about or with, with your team, certainly uh, when you guys have the incredible season that you guys had, only three losses the entire season in 2020. And I'm curious, you know, Coach Hart saying that, you know, you guys are just going after another one. But when you have a season as dominant as you guys had in 2020 and you return so much talent, that has to breed a bunch of confidence as you guys get set for this year. It does. I think, you know, it's, it's a comp confident, um, but not comfortable group. Uh, you know, guys who have been at the club, uh, myself and, and several other guys have been here. This will be our third year. Um, there's no room for complacency. There's no room for, for being comfortable. We, we've, the, the staff have done an unbelievable job of bringing in players. That's going to push um, guys at every position, guys who are, you know, um, may have been starters last year. It's uh, it's all up for grabs again, which is, is great. That's what you want in your club and your culture. Um, and you look around the league, teams are, teams are stocking up trying to um, chase down Greenville Triumph at this point. You know, we, we, we were the, the champions last year. We're going to have that sort of target on your back. You usually tend to get everyone's best um, when they're going up against the, uh, the past champions. So um Teams are teams are putting together good rosters. We've had a couple of our own players move or our former players move to other clubs within our league. So um, it's it's going to be an interesting year. I think we're, we're geared up well with, with the core that we have and the players that we've added. Um, but <laughs> both both the seasons I've been here, everything has been earned. A lot of one nothing games, two one zero zero. It's just it's, it's a real grind of a season and grind of a league, um, which makes every week interesting. Now, it's interesting, though, that, you know, we're going into year three of the Green Bull Triumph and you're one of the guys on the inaugural team. Um, and when you go into that kind of situation and we'll get into your backstory here in a little bit. But, you know, you played a lot of soccer before you usually, for the most part, have, a, you know, some familiarity with the roster that's coming together as you guys, you know, play year in, year out with you know, whatever team it is, but going into the scenario of a brand new startup team in uh, 2019, how did you guys approach that? And then, you know, how have you seen the team grow in the past two seasons and really how uh, the upstate has really come to uh, support you guys in a pretty big way? Uh, you know, the sport's growing nationally without question, uh, but locally it's taken major strides as well. Yeah, I think one of the cool things about this club from its, um, you know, its start before a before a player was announced, before, you know, the badge was released, there were people here supporting just the idea of having a professional soccer team in Greenville. So um, it was very grassroots um, supporter started. And so you knew you were always going to have that backing from the community and, and uh, you know, the fans and the supporters here, which as a player coming into it, um, League One was brand new. Greenville Triumph was brand new. Didn't really know what to expect, but um, once uh, I think for a lot of guys who have been around the professional game for a few years, once they saw John Harks' name attached to this project, um, it, it kind of uh, opened a lot of guys' eyes like this could be a really great opportunity. Um, myself being one, I'd, I'd played for Coach Harks in Cincinnati. Um, my, my rookie season as a pro back in 2016, um, he gave me my first contract. So when, uh, when I saw that he was, was taking this over, um, naturally I kind of kept my, my eye on things. I was playing in Phoenix at the time. Um, but I thought it could be a really interesting opportunity to go be a part of a club, help, help start it from the ground up. Um, and, you know, luckily with, with coach Harks, he, he envisioned it in the same way. He saw an opportunity for me here. Um, so I'm very grateful to him for, for, um, giving me that chance. Um, but, you know, you, you come in, you bring in a, a group of guys that were, and, you know, I'm not afraid to say it, but the, the three years prior to coming to Greenville, uh, my three professional seasons, I was um, backup goalkeeper, third string goalkeeper, um, really enjoyed being a pro, but wasn't really getting the opportunity to get a lot of minutes and games and grow as a, as a player um, and a person. So, um we had, we had several of those types of guys coming in, guys who were coming in with a chip on their shoulder, um, hadn't had, you know, um, as much success as they would have liked earlier in their careers. Um, and I think that was the perfect formula here. You, you, you bring them together in 2019, you, you add in some young, hungry rookies that we had that year. And um, 
a tremendous season came, uh, you know, third place in the table, um, was able to make the playoffs, won our playoff semifinal, made it to the league final, unfortunately lost in the final, but, um, they did such a great job building the roster and handpicking guys who are going to come together and, uh, and do good things. And then, you know, you keep around a good core of that for year two, now year three, um, the clubs, it's just doing that right now. And it's, it's an awesome thing to be a part of. Now, catch people up on some of your backstory there. You're born in California. You played collegiately at South Florida than Xavier. You've been a pro ever since. Uh, you mentioned uh, a couple of your stops, Tucson, then Cincinnati, then Phoenix before landing in Greenville. Uh, when, when you are fighting for playing time during those points, how do you grow as a player uh, when you have as much success as you did in college? I mean, multiple awards here, Big East uh, co-goalkeeper of the year. Um, how do you grow when you're not getting the opportunities? And I'm curious, uh, as a California boy, when you're playing in uh, Tucson and Phoenix and Cincinnati, which of those stops were the biggest culture shock for you? Um, I'll start with that question. The biggest culture shock for me was probably Ohio going to Cincinnati just because, uh, you know, growing up in California, I actually went to, um, IMG Academy in high school, which is based in Bradenton, Florida, kind of a sports boarding school. So had lived in Florida for a couple of years, um, Arizona, West coast, got some, you know, family friends down there. Wasn't, wasn't too big, but when I left the university of South Florida to go to Xavier, which is what brought me to Cincinnati, um, I went there in January 2015, which uh, I believe on record was one of their worst winters in 20 or 30 years, something like that. And I, I remember getting there and I'm like, what am I getting myself into here in the Midwest? This is snow used to be where you go, you know, you go to Lake Tahoe to go on vacation for a couple of days. It was not where you lived. Um, so that, that was the biggest culture shock in terms of in terms of that. But, um, yeah, I've had I've had a few stops uh, different places as a pro, obviously played at two universities as well. Um, and the majority of my career, I mean, in college as well, I, I sat on the bench for more games than I played. So for me, it's always been, um, a bit of an underdog thing. It's part of the goalkeeping position, right? Only one guy can play week in and week out. So you usually have two, three, four keepers on a roster. Um, so there are going to be guys who don't play. And for me, it was always about, you know, how can I grow? How can I become better? How can I be a good teammate? How can I make sure the starting goalkeeper, um, that, that day is warmed up properly. He's ready to go and he's going to help the team win. So I, I always tried to keep a positive approach to situations that could, you know, easily be construed as negative and, and, and tough to deal with. Um, and I think I've been able to grow so much as a person because of some of those adversities and, um, you know, having to be patient, having to keep working and Greenville for me has really been the, um, sort of coming out moment of the professional career I wanted. Um, you know, you, you talk about some of the individual accolades, which have been awesome. Um, winning a championship. I've been a part of teams that have been to championships, but when you watch from the sideline, it's always a little bit different than getting to be out there on the field. So um, I never take that for granted every game I get to play because I know what it's like to, to not be able to play. Um, and, and it's part of the game, but it's definitely, uh, I probably learned more as a person, as a man, um, with some of the, the hardships and those tough times I've had to deal with than, uh, you know, some of these successes and awards. I, I want to piggyback on one of those points before I move on to my list here. But, you know, you look at – I equate soccer to uh, basketball a lot where it's just constant movement. Guys want to get into a flow. And when you're, uh, you know – a midfielder or something like that you're constantly moving back and forth but when you're a goalkeeper uh you know staying relaxed and in tune with the moment has to be paramount and i imagine that when your playing time is choppy it's really hard to get into the flow of the game and it's hard to keep the nerves away and you know deal with any kind of anxiety uh how difficult was that for you when you did get your opportunities to, you know, not over uh, analyze the moment that, okay, this is my shot. I, you know, I can't let it go up here. Uh, I'd imagine that there's some head games that go along with that. There absolutely is. Yeah. There's, there, there's a lot of in the goalkeeping position, the mental side is such a big part of it. Um, obviously big in, in all of sport, but um, a big part for goalkeepers because you're, you're on your own back there. Um, you know, you're, not seeing as much action. You're not running around as much as some of the other players. You're not as in physically engaged in the game as much as they, they would be. And at Greenville Triumph, we, you know, 
we pride ourselves in being one of the teams who gives up, you know, least amount of shots, least amount of goals. So there really isn't um, as much action as some of the other goalkeepers across the league may be getting. And um, I love that. That's, that's how we want it to be. It's by design. Um, but, you know, for me, when I was stepping into the starting role uh, in 2019, it was easy to look back and say, you know, I I've, I've, haven't played more than two or three meaningful matches in the last two or three years. Um, so how will I handle games week in and week out? How, how will my body hold up? How will all these things come together? And um, I think the biggest thing for me during that time, during that early stretch of games was one, the confidence in that coach Harks instills in his players um, when he believes in you and, and he has confidence in you, you feel like, you know, you can, you can do anything out on the field. So that was a big piece for me. Um, having the group of guys that I had around me was big. A few of them I played with in Cincinnati. Um, so those relationships were already built going into the, the 2019 season, with, which was a big help. Um, and, and for me, it's, you know, it's keep the highs low, and the lows high, um, you know, you, you want to have a short-term memory as a goalkeeper, um, both with mistakes and, and um, successful moments, because the next, the next thing's happening right away. So um, we, you know, if I, if I make a mistake, I try not to get too low. If I have a, a big time save, try not to get too high, keep myself even keel in the middle. And it's, it's proven to, uh, to work thus far. So I'm trying to obviously always harnessing it and, and trying to sharpen it and, and tweak, tweak it around. But um, it's been a good recipe uh, up to this point. Yeah, we, we've seen situations where, you know, the, the possession goes to the other side of the field and, you know, corner after corner after corner, that kind of thing. Do you have that any, any, any moments where, you know, you're the little league kid standing in right field and the ball's not coming to you and you're just like, yeah, it's hard not to daydream. You know, you hear NASCAR drivers talk about that when they're right, yeah. lap 80 of 400. They just – their mind starts to drift elsewhere. Did you ever have a moment, um, you know, or, uh, you know, a funny story about where it kind of like had to snap right back into it in a heartbeat? I mean, it, I'd be lying if I say that didn't happen from game to game. There was actually a match last year where um, my – family obviously through COVID hard for people to travel uh, my mom and brother had flown out for the game and my brother had flown in literally minutes before the match so they got there a little late and we were we were in the middle of the game it was probably 15 20 minutes into the first half and um out of the corner of my eye I was like I think that's my brother and I kind of look at, you know the game's going on luckily everything was at the other end of the field but I got to see my mom and my brother for the first time in what had been months um so there there are always those little things but obviously um those split split seconds can make or break a game. So I, uh, I have little, I don't want to say mantras, but little things in my head when I do find myself maybe slipping off somewhere else, cause it, it does happen. Um, things that I, I say or trigger just to pull me right back in and, and, and get right to it. Um, you uh, play internationally for Guam and for, for old guys like me before the MLS really came into form, you know, the, uh, the memories I have of watching uh, big time soccer is international play, you know, the world cup, the Olympics, that kind of thing. So I'm curious, you know, did you have when I believe your first year was 2012, was there a pinch me moment at any point? Was there a match that you can pinpoint where you just kind of look around and be like, Oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening. Um, and then, you know, how do you balance the preparation uh, playing internationally and the travel uh, while you're playing for green bowl as well? Yeah, the, the, the getting to have the opportunity to be a member of the Guam men's national team has been um, one of the coolest, unique um, things in my career. Um, it comes by way of my mom's side of the family, her, uh, her whole side of the family's uh, from the island. It being a U.S. territory, you don't need a different passport, so that, so that always helps. Um, and, and I've been fortunate to be able to be a part of that fold since 2012, so... I think I'm getting somewhere close to, to 20 caps um, up to this point over the last eight years, but uh, another team, another place where for, for several years, I wasn't the starting goalkeeper. So a lot of my first experiences um, with the, with the first team, with the, with the national team was um, sitting on the bench. So you travel a heck of a long way to go and not actually play in some of these games, but I got to be a lot uh, around a lot of pro players at that time, which for me, um, as a college player, 
that was huge. I got to learn from these guys who have, have been in the professional game. You, you know, you kind of pick their brain and, and figure out, you know, what does it really take to be a pro? So I, I, I give a lot of credit to my ability to, to push on after college and play professionally to those experiences, those guys, those relationships. Um, but I do remember the, you know, my first international cap was, uh, I was 18, just about turning 19. Um, we were playing against the Philippines in the Philippines on their independence day. So pack stadium, um, the whole thing. And I just remember walking out, uh, you know, they, they play the FIFA anthem for those games. And then you do the, the national anthem for each country. And, um, I remember the second I walked out for the FIFA anthem, it was, I, I mean, just chills up and down. I was like this, you know, you kind of look around you're like, this is, this is what you see on TV as a kid, what you see in world cup. So, those opportunities are uh, pretty unbelievable. Um, and uh, I'm very fortunate to be at a club like Greenville where coach Harks has played at that level. He understands what it means to players to represent their country. So um, I'm actually navigating with him, the logistics around uh, three world cup qualifiers that we have in um, late May, early June, which now seeing the triumph schedule that just came out in the last uh, week or two bodes really well. Cause there is a break in the schedule there um, for, for the triumph. So working through logistics, obviously international travel, COVID protocols, quarantines, all these things that come with that. Um, but the club's always been super supportive of, of me leaving, um, to play with Guam. And, um, that's not always the case for players in their clubs, which, which makes sense. So I'm, I'm very happy to be somewhere where they, uh, support that. Yeah, I heard from, through the grapevine that, uh, your sister also plays for the Guam national team, which is, Pretty incredible, but it naturally draws the question who the best athlete in your family is. And I'm going to need an honest answer here from you. So, yeah, my sister, uh, my sister was a great, great high school player, um, has battled ACL injuries. Um, she was diagnosed with epilepsy when she was 12. So her story of how she kind of got through high school and, and recruited to play college soccer, she played at the University of Hawaii. Um, and, and has gotten to have the experience to play with the Guam national women's national team, the, the Masakata um, as well. Um, so, you know, I selfish competitive me wants to say me, but she's had to deal with a heck of a lot more um, in terms of her own personal life to be the athlete and the person she is. So I, I, I give her the credit there. Um, it's funny. We were, uh, we were joking yesterday. I actually, out of nowhere, I, I'm not really sure how, but on Instagram, I, I received one of those blue check verification things. And she called me right away, um, giving me a hard time about it, saying, you know, how it took me six years as a pro to finally get one of those. But um, no, we, we have a great little competitive spirit in, in our family. And um, I'm one of four. My little brother played soccer as well. So uh, it's always been a big part of our family. That's awesome. I mean, it's a pretty incredible accomplishment for both of you, let alone to have it in the same family. Uh, you know, you played a lot of pro ball in the U.S. and, you know, you've really come into, you know, you mentioned you were struggling for playing time early on with some of those other clubs. And, you know, now you've really kind of launched into onto everyone's radar here in Greenville. You've been goalkeeper of the year both years in League One. Um, you know, you have a, a championship already. You're going for another one. What what is the end game for Dallas J? Do you, do you want to move back up the ranks? What ideally, you know, you're kind of right in your prime right now. So I'm curious what, what the goals are, what's the pecking order, what's the ladder look like for you? Um, yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's definitely long-term goals with, with short-term focus. Um, so, you know, I think any player would be crazy to say that they don't want to play, um, you know, at the highest level they potentially can, which here in the U.S. is MLS. Um, you have a, a league above us in the USL, USL championship. Um, but, you know, we being at this club, it's the, after year one, it felt like obviously unfinished business. Um, didn't win the championship in 2019. So you come back in 2020, you win the championship. Um, I, I think a lot of people could look in and say, you know, for Dallas J, uh, you know, one of it, individual awards, they, you know, finished off that business they couldn't do in 2019. Surely he'll be out of there. Um, but, you know, for me, with Coach Harks, with this club, you know, we're still growing. We still have things we want to achieve. Um, I would I would love as, you know, personally to, to, to go back and why not win the award three times? Why not win a second championship in this league? Um, and, I, and I think one of the great things for players right now, myself included, is um, the way U.S. soccer is going domestically 
you're seeing a lot more movement between these leagues. You're seeing League One players move up to the championship. Championship players move up to MLS. Um, just this past offseason, there were three goalkeepers from the USL championship, the second division, that moved up to MLS. Um, so myself as a goalkeeper, seeing that, you know, even at 28, 29, 30, 31, these guys can, you know, there's still levels that you can you can reach um, is really encouraging. And, and I think in the past it was kind of uh, U.S. soccer didn't really have that um, that opportunity for players to continue to, to jump levels. If, you know, you, you had to be 21, 22, 23, a young, promising player to do that. And now it's uh, – the, the game, the leagues are getting closer. You can see it in this preseason. There's MLS teams losing to championship teams. Um, Tormenta who's in our league, league one team beat an MLS team yesterday. So there's, there's the levels are getting tighter. The players are all getting better. Um, and I think you're seeing that with the U S national team as well. They're improving. And I think everyone has high hopes for them for this upcoming world cup. So it's a great time to be a, a player here in the U S right now. And I'm, I'm excited to be where I'm at. And obviously know there's, there's levels of, above that I could potentially reach. So you played all over the country. You played uh, multiple places around the world. You know, we're you look at all the different fan bases for individual sports, and there, you know, there are some fan bases that stand out more than others. You know, the Browns fans in Cleveland and the NFL. Uh, I'm curious when you see some of these international soccer matches, the environment looks different than anything else in professional sports. So I'm curious, the most, uh, the craziest thing you've seen from fans in your soccer career keep in mind that this is uh safe for tv is what we're looking for here right. and then uh, i'm curious you know what how that compares to the craziest thing you've seen from uh fans here in greenville yeah i'll uh I, i'd love to answer that question that's a great question I, i'd say the the coolest craziest um, biggest experiences i've seen as a player up to this point um i think from a club standpoint, when, when I was at FC Cincinnati, um, from day one, no one, you know, USL teams were getting maybe 3000, 5000, 7000 fans a game. Um, we came out in our inaugural match. I think we had something like 16 or 18,000. And, and that first season we were consistently getting over 20,000 fans a game out of nowhere. No one knew why, how, you know, you have other sport, you have the Cincinnati Reds, you had the Bengals there. There were other, you know, UC basketball, Xavier basketball, there are other, other options for sports fans. Um, and they really just captured lightning in a bottle in Cincinnati. And that's why I think that's why that club, you know, has gone from USL and now it's become an MLS franchise was the unbelievable support from the community. Um, so the best match I think there was we, we played Chicago fire in the U S open cup, um, won the game in penalties pack stadium. I think it was something like 34,000 in there. Um, unbelievable night it was it was just it, I, I wasn't even rostered I actually had a hamstring injury that night so I was on the not on the sideline dressed um but unbelievable thing to be a part of um with Guam probably the craziest fan experience was we we um in 2015 we played against Iran they were one of the teams in World Cup qualifiers we were paired up against so you put you play everyone home and away so they uh they came to Guam we played them there and we went to Iran, which isn't a place U.S. citizens usually go, um, but we were able to go there for four days. We were we stayed in Tehran for four days. We played in the Azadi Stadium, which seats a hundred thousand or something like that. It's like the big house in Michigan. They just pack them in. That day they they didn't. I I, I think we were Guam was a bit of a small country. We didn't um, we didn't get on people's radars for a match they wanted to come out and see. But unbelievable stadium. There you know, and the, the interesting thing about interesting thing about that is um the fans at that time i don't know if it's still the case this was in 2015 only men are allowed in the stadium um due to the, some of the muslim culture and some of the, the laws there so a, a crazy experience to be a part of real hostile environment you kind of recognize it when you go and you're like this is this is different um and then in greenville you know we had our, our first match 4,000 pack stadium unbelievable night three red cards come back win um, so that was an awesome thing to kick off. And, and last year was just unfortunate. You know, you have, you have COVID. We played a couple of matches behind closed doors. Um, we were able to allow fans in at a certain point, which was great. But I, I am hopeful we can get back to some of those bigger crowds this season and, and really um, allow the community to come out because that's why we're here. You know, that's why this club was started was to be a, a vehicle for this community to enjoy sport and come together.
So you come from an athletic family. You know, you mentioned you have three siblings, I believe. Uh, so there's a lot of competition there. Uh, but I'm, I, I always uh, I wonder when you have professional athletes at one particular sport, was it always soccer for you? Uh, you? You mentioned you went to IMG, so that's pretty focused at that point. But, you know, if Dallas J isn't a professional soccer player, what's the sport that you wanted to go to? What's the one that you dream about still since you're already living a lot of people's dream uh, that are soccer fans? Right now, it, it was it was soccer for me. It was goalkeeping from age seven on. I, I wasn't a field player after age seven, which I would not recommend to any young players today. You you have to experience all those different positions as a young player. You don't want to hone in on one too early. Um, but I was a goalkeeper from the very start. Uh, played a little bit of basketball. Played um, competitive travel baseball up till high school, which is when I left to go to IMG and really just focus on soccer. Um, so baseball, I mean, at the time, I, honestly, I, I would say I was probably a better baseball player than soccer player. I just enjoyed soccer more. Uh, it's, it just stuck more for me. Um, but if I can, if I could go back, I'd play some more golf. Um, I actually, I just had to turn it off, but I've had the masters on, um, and, and a few guys on the team here, we've, we really picked it up during quarantine last year. Cause it was one of the socially distanced things you could do during COVID. So, um, I, I wish I would have started my golf game a little earlier in life because that, that, that would have been a great path to be on. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, I know you play uh, nas- internationally for Guam, uh, but U.S. men's soccer has been uh, a highly talked about thing uh, for the last uh, decade or so, ever since they kind of really took that next step. And, you know, you can see it as the MLS grows. And as you mentioned, the other leagues are starting to close the gap with them. And I think competition is how you really grow the game. You know, one of the big arguments is that, you know, the top athletes in America for the most part don't play soccer is that they're going towards basketball or football or baseball. Um, but, you know, when you look at the, I'm curious, your entire take of U S men's soccer on an international level, you know, that they didn't qualify for the Olympics for the third straight year. There's a lot of disappointment around that. And then there's all the success that the U S women's team is having in international competition. Uh, Do you see, you know, this grassroots effort as the game continues to grow in the country that the U S can be one of the dominant programs in the world, or is this something that's still a long way off and everyone's got to kind of, pump the brakes a little bit, you know, you don't jump up to the Germany's and the France's, uh, you know, right off the bat uh, when the interest level is really starting to kick into uh, another gear. Yeah. I I mean, when it comes to the U S men's national team, I'm, I'm so hopeful. I mean, the, the, the position they're in right now, the players coming through that are in the pool. um, And it's interesting for, for guys like myself who have been pros for a couple of years here in the U S um, a lot of these guys are guys that we played with or against in college. We played with or against as pros. Um, Aaron Long has been a pretty steady center back in the full. I, I played with him in FC Tucson in uh, my PDL days. Um, you talk about the Olympic team. JT Marcinkowski was one of the goalkeepers with that squad. I think he played the second game um, of that, uh, that tournament. But, um, you know, these are guys you know and you, you, you've known them since – they were 15, 16, 17, you know, college age players. So to see them as the guys coming up and taking the national team, what we hope to be the next level um, is really cool. Cause in the past it was just, you know, the, the pros you knew as a kid. So to know these guys on a personal level is awesome, but you know, you have the Christian Pulisic and the Weston McKinney's and, and these guys who are not just at big clubs, but they're playing and contributing at these big, big clubs um, on a more consistent basis at younger ages than you've had in the past for U.S. soccer. So I do think uh, I do think the pieces are starting to fall in place. But in terms of timeline, um, obviously, the, the, the under 23s didn't qualify for the Olympics. So we still have work to be done. But I do think with the way the USL is going, the MLS um, players going over to Europe at younger ages um, and sticking in Europe, not just going over and, and coming back. Um, is is encouraging uh, obviously the 2022 world cups the the one upcoming and everyone's hopeful for um especially after missing the last one but you look at 2026 it's going to be in the u.s um i kind of have that one circled as that could be that could be you know we're that's five years down the line that could be a really interesting time um for u.s soccer uh, you know given the trajectory it's on 
So you guys open up the season. I want to get a little bit of a preview here with you on April 24th against Richmond. But there are a couple other matches I wanted to touch on that uh, should draw a lot of interest. North Texas comes to Triumph Stadium on May 1st. They've obviously got a championship pedigree there. North Carolina FC as well. Uh, so, you know, you got some big matches right out the gate here early on in the season. And then the one that pretty much everyone wants to see is you guys against Union Omaha, the match that got canceled for uh, the League One final last year. Um, when you know that you're facing that kind of talent right out the gate, the sense of urgency uh, in preseason practice, I'd imagine, is heightened a little bit knowing you guys got to be on your game. And certainly when you uh, you end the season the way that you guys did last year, you want to silence any doubters that you guys were in fact the champs. Right, exactly. And yeah, you, you name off some of those teams we start the season against. I mean, Richmond, um, a team that's kind of been our thorn in our sides. They've always been a difficult opponent. Um, I want to say they've, we, I don't remember specifically, but I want to say four or five meetings in the last two years. Um, they've, they've definitely won two, maybe three of those. So always a difficult opponent, especially when you're going on the road, opening game, you know, they're going to be up for it. They're going to have their fans behind them. So a, a tough place to go. Um, you come back, you play in North Texas, who is one of those wild card teams with such a youthful squad guys. They bring through FC Dallas's Academy. You don't really know who they're going to be bringing to the table week in and week out. They have such a big pool of young players, young talented players, um, guys who in the last, you know, they've had guys we played against the last two years who have gone over to clubs like Roma and Bayern, um, these young talented guys. So always a tough opponent. Um, North Carolina, new to the league, uh, going away from home. They're stocking up with a lot of their young Academy players as well. Some, some um, veteran pros, and they're coming from the league above. So you have to, they, you know, they, they are a team you have to take seriously. And of course, you know, Omaha, it's going to be that, that I don't want to call it a rematch. I, I, I already know the narrative going into that game is this will, you know, this will be the final we didn't get. No, it's going to be the fourth game of the 2021 season. You know, the, the, the supporters, I love when that you see them going back and forth on Twitter and all that. And I love that. Um, but when it comes down to game day, it'll be, you know, we're just looking to get three points. That's going to be the focus. Um, but it's, it's a tough schedule out the gate, but you look at our preseason schedule, we've played an MLS team in DC United, tied them one, one, um, went over to Charleston, sat in traffic, got there late, basically just had to hop off the bus and had, you know, 45 minutes to get ourselves ready and, and played a game. We played them to a zero, zero tie. Um, and we're playing what, in my opinion, is, you know, the elite team in the USL championship, Louisville City, this weekend. So we're we're preparing ourselves the right way by going up against the right opponents to, to be ready for the year. And I imagine one that uh, you guys, I'd imagine, get excited for is when you get to go up to New England, play the Revolution in uh, Gillette Stadium. Uh, you know, the environment is certainly it's a bigger stadium, obviously, um, but. I'd imagine just from your perspective, that that's a cool deal. Anytime you guys get a chance to do that, especially for the guys that don't get to play international ball like you do. Right. Yeah. The, yeah. The, getting to play in a stadium like that's awesome. Um, actually, when we went there last year, uh, the Patriots were in preseason. So they were on site when we were there. They were actually um, behind the, the field is the suite where they, um, you know, kind of like an owner's suite the, the that's at field level and while we were warming up the Patriots were in there watching film Belichick was I don't know if he was wearing his cutoff hoodie but he was I mean they were in there so getting to see in there was cool um I am a lifelong I can't say Oakland Raiders anymore Las Vegas Raiders fan i um, growing up in the Bay Area so I always have a bad taste in my mouth with the Patriots due to the tuck roll game back in 2001 or whatever it was um I don't think they deserved that call, that championship, and then that dynasty that came after that championship. I think it was all taken away from the Raiders. So it's cool to get up there. Uh, we, we unfortunately lost when we went up there last year, so we'll look to right that wrong when we go back this year. I, I hate to tell you, I'm a Baltimore boy, so we got you guys in 2000 as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was season tickets. Plan, uh... me, me and my dad would go to games. Um, you know, we had season tickets my, my whole life. So seeing them leave was a bummer, but – now I got a reason to, I guess, go to Vegas every year. You don't need a reason to go to Vegas. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, it's going to be an incredible season, uh, Dallas. 28 matches over 29 weeks. 
Uh, you guys are defending the title, but you're not defending the title. You're going for another one to stick with the coach speak. Uh, before I let you go, I'm curious as a California guy who's been, you know, a bunch of different places, what do you tell folks about Greenville, South Carolina? I know from my experience, again, coming from Baltimore, you know, you don't have a ton of information about Greenville until you get here. Uh, but I'm, you know, I'm wondering what you tell people about Greenville as uh, it continues to gain a lot of popularity as one of the gems of the South. I, I mean, I tell my my family, I tell my friends who are still on the West Coast and, and, and other places, come, come visit, come. I want you to come watch me play a game, but come to Greenville. You're not, no one ever comes and says a bad thing. You're going to come and you're going to love it. Um, I, I love when I have family coming to town and, you know, take them down to main street restaurants, bars, um, you know, the park, take them out on the swamp rabbit trail, swamp rabbit cafe, you know, the, all these incredible things that um, for me, you know, Cincinnati, Phoenix, bigger metropolitan areas um, to come to Greenville. It was probably cliche to say, but that like small town feel in a bigger city situation. Um, so uh, for us, I think it's been the perfect storm for us players. Um, you're able to really get out in the community and have an effect, which can be harder in some of those, those bigger cities where you compete with big sports franchises and, and, and some other things, you know, for us, it's, it's the swamp rabbits, the drive and the triumph and obviously um, Clemson and, and Furman and their sports, but uh, great relationships between all the teams. So I think for players, it's cool to, to get to live here and feel like you're making a difference and, and, you know, getting to know people in the community because it, it, it is hard in some of those bigger cities. So I think uh, obviously people are moving all over the map right now with, with COVID and, and Greenville seeing an influx and there's a good reason for it. Well, you know, I do think it's really cool, you know, notwithstanding the success that you guys have had to watch this community really rally around you guys and support you uh, right from the get-go. As you mentioned, that first game was incredible and the popularity just continues to grow. Uh, Dallas J, I I appreciate you uh, taking some time with us. Uh, you know, I think I'm going to work on like a celebration for you every time you get a save, maybe, you know, do like a hair flip or something like that, just to make you stand out a little bit. The, the, the hair isn't, it's something I'm trying. It was my, I started it in quarantine. I've never had long hair in my life. So it's kind of been a, a running thing over last, last season. I couldn't cut it. We were doing so well. It just didn't make sense. So um, it's going into this year. We'll, we'll see how long I take it, but I do uh, the, the Reedy River Riot here, our, our fan group, they do, uh, they do an awesome job, but they have a, rendition of sweet caroline that they'll sing after uh after i make a save in a game it's it's sweet dallas J, and they they go into it so it's it's always cool getting to getting to hear that so um i think i'm well served in that in that celebration uh area but we'll uh we'll see what i can do with this i don't know we're, we're i'm still figuring out how it's going to be on game day is it going to be back is it going to be a bun i'm figuring it out well you know i think once you get into like you know the 20th and 30th minute it's going to be tough to keep it looking straight the way you have it right there. <laughs> exactly. I think a plan B and plan C is probably in, uh, you know, your best interest. So, again, uh, a big season on the way. Uh, Dallas, Jay, I certainly appreciate you taking some time with us. Uh, the season kicks off April 24th as uh, the Triumph take on Richmond on the road. Uh, and then the first uh, home game against North Texas on May 1st. So just – a couple of weeks from now, I, I know the uh, anticipation is high and uh, certainly wish you the best of luck as you guys go on uh, to defend and yet go after another League One championship. Appreciate it, Aaron. Thank you for the time. And, uh, yeah, we're excited for the, the season and we're excited to see the fans out there. Dallas J, the two-time defending League One goalkeeper of the year and, of course, the triumph. 2020 League One champions. Uh, I certainly encourage you to go check out a game there at Legacy Charter if you haven't been out there yet. Uh, it's an incredible atmosphere, and the Triumph do a great job. And certainly, when they're winning as much as they do, that makes it a whole lot easier. That's a wrap for this week's edition of In-Depth with Fox Carolina Sports. Again, thanks to Dallas Jay, and thank you for joining us here. We're back with uh, another great guest coming up next week. Have a great night.